And I'd like for someone to volunteer to read verses 9 through 11. Romans 7, 9 through 11. And I need a volunteer for that, and I need a volunteer for someone to read Acts 7, verses 3 through 6. Volunteer for Acts 7. For I was alive. Hang on, hang on. Let's begin with uh, Romans 7, 9 through 11. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Okay, and now let's read Acts 7, 3 through 6. Volunteer for Acts chapter 7, 3 through 6. Let over here. Can you ever, please? Yes, volunteer for uh, reading of the New American Standard Version, starting in verse 3. And said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. Yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. Thank you. Is anyone better qualified than Paul to warn people about the deceptions of man, philosophy, uh, speculations, uh, opinions. What happened in that famous conversion, Acts chapter 9, which we know is on the road to Antioch? What happened there? He got knocked off his boots. He got blinded, he was on, fell off whatever he was on. And uh, what does Jesus say to him? Saul, why are you persecuting me? In, in saying that he got knocked off his horse, what I'd like to bring it back to is his glory was laid in the dust. Yeah. The glory of man of I'm riding into town and I'm going to take care of this situation. His glory was laid in the dust. He was in a humble position, ready to receive what he was going to be man. Hmm. Did he know who was talking about? Yeah. He says Lord. No. Lord. What does the word Lord mean? <laughs> <laughs> Someone in control. Yes. It's not speaking of God or Jesus or anything like that. It's speaking. Someone is in control, stronger power than I have. Because mm -hmm. I have these I have this paperwork from all of the leaders in Jerusalem to go and arrest anyone that sounds like they're a Jesus worshiper. And now, and I brought some muscle with me. Yeah. To enforce. Yes. And now he's knocked off his whatever horse. And uh, he says, Lord, who are you? And what does Jesus say? I am Jesus. We are persecuted. Now, at this point, what do we know? We know that Saul was taught in the highest academic levels of his day to be an attorney. And we also know that whenever he asked questions, and you can read it for yourself in the chapter in Acts of the Apostles, apostasy in Galatia, and the uh, and the Jerusalem Council, which is where I'm bringing this from, he, when he asked, well, what about this Jesus? He was resurrected. What did the religious leaders say? That's a falsehood. That's a fabrication of his disciples. Read it for yourself. And what about all these other things? And they always had an answer. Now, Jesus says, I'm Jesus. And his life flashes. And he says, what have I been doing? And what does it say? It's hard to Lord, what would you have me do? Good answer, huh? <laughs> All of this happens, you know, a lifetime of studying about how to get rid of Christians and preparing him for to be a Pharisee, which he was. Folks, it is absolutely crucial that we understand what conversion means. Conversion does not mean that you're con convinced that Saturday is the correct day to go to church. That is not conversion. Amen. Okay? It is not conversion.
and veggie burgers and all that goes with that. What are we? Well, the, there's an interesting term there that says it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, plural. And so when you pour over Paul's experience, he was being pricked long before he went on the road to Damascus. That was the biggest prick of all. And so in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 6, verse 15, it says, And all, this is about step, all sat in the council, you can believe Paul was there, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been a face of an angel. And so in Acts 7, Stephen speaks, Paul's listening, Saul is listening. And he's being pricked, pricked. He knew, Philippians 2, he knew the whole story that Stephen was sharing. But he never heard it like this before. And it troubled him. How can these fanatics, how can these offshoots look like this, have a face of an angel? How can they speak with such power? It can't be. I know the Bible. I know the Bible better than all of them. And yet they have such power. This can't be so. And on the road to Damascus, he was troubled. He wasn't as zealous as he was in the past. He was very slowly reading it and read the life sketches of Paul and not all my trades. You, you'll take that. And on the way there, that's when the Lord knew it was right for the, the last trick. And that's when it blew his mind. And that blew his mind so much that he missed this. He missed Jesus and all of the scriptures. And he went back. That's why Paul read so prolifically. He saw Jesus all over the place. Genesis. Just go reading it. That's what he sought to Christ. He missed him all this time, and now he found him. One who's all together. Thank you. One of the passages that Deborah read for us was verses 4 and 5 of Galatians chapter 4. For when the fullness of the time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. What? <clears throat> So that he could redeem those that were where? Under the law. Right. Do you find it assuring or reassuring that Scripture proves itself over and over and over? Remember one of the Scriptures that we read at the beginning of our study? That the 70-year prophecy, or the, whatever you want to call it, the 490 weeks, will fulfill when? 34 AD? Crucifixion. Cut off in the midst of the week. Who would like to turn to Daniel chapter 9 and see what the subheading is between verses 24 and 23? Daniel chapter 9, subheading between verses 23 and 24. Anyone? 70 weeks in the Messiah. How do you like that? <laughs> do you find that reassuring? Now, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent his son, <coughs> born of a woman. What does that mean? Angelic creation. He was. He has our DNA and that of Adam. Good. By the, by the way, the word "cut off" means circumcision. Yes. It's the Christ was cut off. Yes. What circumcision really means. Yes. The cross. Now, we have a parallel statement to that in uh, Romans four, five, six, eight, and ten. Remember Romans five six. When I was helpless and ungodly, what did Jesus do? Verse 8. When I was a sinner, what did Jesus do for me? He died. When I was his declared enemy, what do enemies do to each other? <laughs> Kill, each Kill each other. And we did a good job of that when we came, didn't we? What do they do to each other? They kill each other. But still, what does verse 10 say? Jesus died for us, and in so doing, he what? Reconciled us. Redeemed us. The word reconcile means that legally, he has now placed us as Adam and Eve were in relation to God before they sinned. That could be at one minute. Yes. Join heirs with him now. We now...
stand before God as Adam and Eve did before they sinned. We're talking grammar here, okay? We're not inventing anything here. <coughs> the word is katalasus in the Greek if you want to look it up. Over here, Kevin? And verse 11 brings that. Yeah. It, 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 expire, you know, it expands on it. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. And that atonement, really, the, the meaning of that word is really at one. Absolutely. If you break it up, that's exactly what it means. So, this redemption was for how many people? All. The Jewish all. people? Yeah. All. Yeah. Whosoever would. So, in order to ethically save us, what does ethic mean? Justice, righteous. Correct. Just where it is. Not cheating. He didn't cheat. According to the law. Good. In the business world, in real estate, the issue of ethics has to do with what is fair? What does Jesus ask me to do in Revelation 3.21? Chuck, I want for you to overcome the way that I overcame. And I say, wait a minute. Because this is what the Christian world is saying. Wait a minute. That's not right. That's not fair. That's unethical. You're asking me to do something with equipment different than what you had to work with. That's what ethics is about. <clears throat> and legally did he say, Romans 8, 3. What did he do? He condemned sin in the flesh and what? Crucified. How can he condemn something that he did not have in himself to condemn and crucify? I am sharing very briefly with you Satan's masterpiece of deception that has infiltrated the Christian world, including our church. If you don't understand this, it makes no sense whatsoever for you to surrender self to Jesus. No sense. Why would you? He didn't do a complete job. If he didn't identify with me at the Incarnation, which is what she read in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, how in the name of ethics can he say to me, I want for you to overcome the way that I overcame? That's why people give up. There's so many people that say, well, that was Jesus. You know, he was so special. And that's just me over here. So pour me another one. I'm sorry. It's, no, <laughs> that's the issue. And do you and I have a responsibility to share from Scripture if Jesus is an ethical and legal redeemer? From Scripture. No opinions, no speculations from Scripture. We have enough opinions and speculations already in the Christian world. We have over 70 different denominations. Isn't that enough of a headache for God? 70 different opinions on this one book? Someone needs to accept the responsibility. Yeah, we teach people that Saturday is the correct day to, church, to go to church, and that is absolutely true. But when a person is dealing with a personal issue in their life, going to church on Saturday is not going to help them. Amen. Amen. A personal relationship with Christ, falling in love with Christ, yeah. now I have something to push the enter button and say, oh, now i got some help here coming. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That's the gospel. And we need to experience it, and the Holy Spirit will show us how to relate it to someone else. But brother, when, when we accept this, we get the anointing, we become joint heirs with heaven. <laughs> and that Spirit of God lives in us just the same as all the stories we read. If that's not taught and preached, we're all in bondage still. Is that true or false? That is true, and the evidence is what? Has Jesus, your life. has Jesus returned yet? Not that I'm aware of. And I have news for you. He's not going to return. Until there's a people, a generation of people on this earth that are experiencing the life that he experienced. And we understand it and are convicted about it. 
And we learn to turn what? Every decision, experience, and temptation over to whom? Yes. Isn't that what he did? Mm -hmm. Was he, was he successful at it? Yes. Yeah. People say that Satan put Jesus on the cross. Half true. <laughs> what did Judas try to do to Jesus? He I has a very withdrawn fine. personality. He's not out there in front. So I'm going to create a situation where he has to declare himself the Messiah. Hmm. Because... The moment that Jesus chose not to come down from that cross, who was condemned to death? In the name of life. Yeah. Folks, these object lessons are crucial for us to understand, or we're not going to have the right motivation to live what we love to call the Christian life. I am focused on this 20 verses because... This is God inspiring Paul to get these people in Antioch, converted Jews and Gentiles to Christianity, straightened out. Mm -hmm. And there's an issue here for us to deal with. Over here, briefly. Yes, briefly. The, the, just throwing this out there. The 1888 message that came to us as a people, Ellen White gives bullet points, page 92 of Testimonies and Ministers, and she says, this message when received, would make us obedient to all the commandments of God. And I have a lot of Pentecostal friends that talk about the same thing. We're free, we're out of bondage, we have the Spirit, but there's no manifestation of obedience to the commandments of God. It's not that we keep the commandments in order to be saved, but there is a, there's fruit there, brother. We become sensitive to the demands of the law. You can't throw that out. And just say, okay. we're free. Free from what? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Paul is inspired to say something very, very significant in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Time doesn't permit, so I'm going to quote it to you. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. The word sin there is an adjective, speaking of the condition. He has made it to be sin for us, who? Knew Jesus, who knew no sin. Why? So that we might be made what? Righteousness. The righteousness of what? God. Of God. Where? In Him. And that's the key word. If you take the word I am out of Paul's writings, the preposition I am, the, his writings would make no sense whatsoever. Amen. I mean, you wouldn't understand the thing he said if you pull out that preposition I am. In the Latin it means Origin. He is the origin of everything related to our experience. Amen. Prove it to yourself. Read Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verse 13 verses. Not now. And count how many times Paul uses the word in him, in the beloved. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. Question. Okay. Um, when you said that um, we... There were two ways to be saved, and one would be if, if we could keep the commandments from the time we were born to the time we died. Not if, but doing it. Doing it. We know the answer to the if. Because, because I was thinking that since um, death came into the world through Adam, that I would be still part of Adam, and I would still have death on my, on my birth certificate. <laughs> Adam, if, even if I'm born... And I'm part of Adam. Adam bought me death. So here I am born. I haven't done anything yet. I'm still part of Adam. I'm still bought, I was born into death. Now I know that that's the, the original same question, but I don't see how me keeping the commandments till I die would still it's count for me, even if it was possible. We're just talking about when a person is condemned. A person is condemned when what? What does Romans 6.23 say? The wages of sin is what? Okay. So, no one has succeeded in that, but technically, there's two ways to be saved. You can keep all the commandments and never sin. Never sin. Because that's how the Jews in Jesus' day thought they were going to be saved. Exactly. And they still think that way. Okay. So, if, if, Jesus, if Jesus redeemed me from my condition... Doesn't it follow that he redeemed me 
into a life of obedience to what? To the, law. to the law. The law is a transcript of God's character. Is that thought biblical or is that fancy thinking? What do we learn in Romans 8 4? Oh, it's right there. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Thank you. That's who I call the designated driver, the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus never chose to open his mouth and say a word or do anything without the letting the Holy Spirit lead him. We're going to really have to cut things. We have to stop at what, 10 minutes till? Yeah. Or 15 minutes till? 10. Yeah. 10. All right. And I really appreciate your participation. That's what a Sabbath school class is. Not a lecture, but a participation. So, what other blessings follow when we believe? Who would like to read John 1, 11 and 12, and 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16? Real, real quick, folks. Please. Volunteers. For John 1, 11 and 12. And 1 Peter, chapter 1, 13 to 16. Okay, John, right here. Peter. Okay. Ready. Okay. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God Amen. to those who believe in his name. Amen. Amen. 1 Peter, 1. Anyway, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Okay. Therefore, yeah. girl, up your loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you, is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You know, God has been impressing people to record that ever since Moses came out of the scene. That's a direct quote from Leviticus 19, verse 2. So, Christ has redeemed us, and in so doing, He becomes what? Our substitute. Now, today we're being taught that Jesus became our substitute instead of us. That's called vicarious salvation. But does the scripture teach us that Jesus actually became us? He did it in our equipment. He did it in us. He did it as us. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. I'm going to quote it to you because I'm running out of time. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us what? Right. Wisdom from God. Mm -hmm. And righteousness. And sanctification. And redemption. Amen. What are we leaving out here? Nothing. That's the whole package right there. And we do not need to opinion it or speculate on it. And verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And verse 31, that according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Is that wild news, biblically speaking, or is that just good advice? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, this biblical truth is guaranteed to become a reality in my life if I do what? Believe it. Believe it. That's the issue. And then, like this brother said earlier, then the Holy Spirit comes in and does what? Takes over. Completes. And we're going to produce more works than all of the computers on this planet are able to keep track of. Amen. But it will never be focused on who? On oh, us. It's all about Him. And people will notice it. Did people notice something that was different about Jesus? Yes, absolutely. Just a little bit different. Yes. And what does Jesus promise to do through us? Jesus. Greater things. Not in importance, but in influence. Geographically. It's crucial that we understand that. Okay. 
Trying to figure out what I leave out. <laughs> Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. I'll read it. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. What is Paul talking about here? They developed their traditions. Very good. What was it? The Pharisees that believed in Acts 15 followed Paul. And they came to the Galatians and said, Listen, it's wonderful you believe in Christ, but you've got to keep along. Got to do this, do this, do this. And we hear it today. And I want to tell us many minutes uh, 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 message, uh, blessings of uh, all blessings. By nature, we're all Pharisees. That's our problem. We all have to do something to contribute to our salvation. And so Paul said to, to the Galatians that in, in chapter 5, it says, But faith worketh by love. And then in chapter 4, verse 15, it says, where is then the blessedness that you spake of? Why bear your record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked up your own eyes and given them to you? That's what faith does. We undermine the power of the gospel. We think the power of the gospel is not enough. There's not enough power there. We've got to do something too. But when the gospel gets a hold of you, brother, just like you said, we're going to do things we never thought we were going to do before. We're going to be beside ourselves. Paul says some people thought he was crazy. God has been trying to teach us this since the Old Testament. Let me read it to you word for word from Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 through 26. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. 24. But let him boast, who, let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows. Amen. Is there a difference between accumulation of knowledge and understanding? Yes. What chapter? Chapter 29 of Jeremiah, verses 23 through 26. I'm reading in verse 24. That he who understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. 25. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised, and yet uncircumcised. What do you think he's saying there? Those that have been what? Visually circumcised, but not circumcised as a heart. Did we study that a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. Here it is, Old Testament. 26. Egypt and Judah and Edom, the sons of Ammon and Moab, and all of those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair of their temples. How's that for picky? For all the nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised. Uh, what? Heart. That's the issue. Was that an accident, or was that the real bell? <laughs> That's the real bell. Okay. Uh, do we face that danger today? Programs are wonderful. Programs are wonderful. But in the Old Testament, when the people understood and believed that God was leading them, what did Moses have to say to them when he asked them to contribute to the building of the temple? Stop, stop, you're giving too much. Isn't that a nice problem? Is that a problem? Is that the right word, a problem? Is that a nice situation to be confronted with? That's what happens when we are truly converted. If the Holy Spirit takes over, and based on how God wants to use us, it's an incredible experience. Now, let's close by taking a look at uh, some of the things that Paul says from verses 12 to 20 of Galatians 4. Uh, Paul was sent by God and Jesus to deliver a special message from whom? God! Not man! Did Paul take it personally when the Galatians rejected his message? Yeah. Yeah. 
Not really. He says, I'm not, you know, I'm not offended by you not accepting what I preach to you. Whoever is offended because someone doesn't accept what they present is focused on who? Self. Instead of the message. What else did Paul talk about? I became one of you. What does that mean? I lived with you. I ate at the table with you. No problem. Unlike Peter and Barnabas and, you know, the others that withdrew themselves. Back in Galatians 2, verse 16. I became one of you.